Did you really say that? <laughs> You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield. Everybody dies but us. Everybody dies but us. And Big Anklevich. The big one. Ooh, my little pretty one. Welcome to the Dunstief Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 2, number 4, page 55. I am Rish, your host. And I'm Big Anklevich, the other host. I'm the ever-competent announcer man. Hell? <laughs> All right, welcome announcer man to the fold, and Oedo T's here as well. Today's story is... Well, there seems to be a typo on my sheet. <laughs> She's supposed to say, My Samantha by Doug McIntyre. That's right. This is Doug McIntyre's third appearance on the Dune, Steve. He has previously appeared with a lovely little story called A Woman Called Witch and also The Ghost of Sadie Worth. Welcome back, Doug, to the show. He has also published stories on The Tiny Globule, The Monsters Next Door, Flash Fiction 500, the Drabbler. <laughs> really? All that, huh? Wow. The Abacat Journal. S&M Horror Magazine. Wait, wait, wait. Say, say that again. No. Clone Pod and the Drabblecast. He also has work printed in the NVF 2008 Halloween Anthology and soon The Darkness. And he will never submit to us again. That's possible. We'd like to thank Lizanne Hurd and Christine Maya Flares for lending their voices to today's episode. Today's music was by Doemi Derelich and L. LaFont. And you can check out links to everything in the show notes. I'm scared and somewhat unprepared. My Samantha by Doug McIntyre. Look out, Dad, Samantha said. I'm running late. She breezed past me on her way to the bathroom as I stood in shock. I didn't know what to say. She sounded like Samantha. She acted like Samantha. But she didn't look like Samantha. I mean, not even a little. Samantha is my 16-year-old daughter, but the girl who just called me Dad was not her. My daughter is a brunette with a dark complexion about 5 feet 6 inches tall. This girl has dirty blonde hair, is light-complected, and at least 5'10". She closed the bathroom door behind her before I had a chance to say anything. I stepped up to the door and spoke through it. Who are you? I asked, still in shock and not really knowing what to say. Dad, I don't have time for this. I'm going to be late for school. Without visual validation, it sounded exactly like Samantha. I thought that maybe she was playing some kind of a trick on me. Who else is in there with you? I asked, reasoning that another girl must have slept over. I didn't remember anyone else being here last night, but I had been drinking. Maybe I had more to drink than I thought. Dad! Samantha exclaimed in exasperation, the way she often does. It's usually her signal for me to back off. I stepped away from the door, confused. I didn't feel hung over. I decided that it must have been a friend of hers after all. Maybe she came over after I went to bed. Maybe she was having troubles at home, or with a boyfriend, or any of a million causes of drama in a teenager's life. I went downstairs to pour my coffee and get ready to go to work myself. I already had my laptop packed in my bag and just needed to grab a quick bite to eat. I put a bagel in the toaster. I could hear Samantha moving around upstairs. She came bounding down just as the toaster popped out my bagel. Can I have that? She asked. She knew she could. It was a regular morning routine for her to steal my bagel as she ran out the door to catch her bus. But the girl who grabbed my bagel wasn't Samantha. It was the blonde girl I'd seen upstairs. Thanks, Dad. She said, just like always. 
before giving me a quick kiss on the cheek and rushing out the door. The normal thing for me to do would have been to put another bagel in the toaster. But I didn't. I just stared at the toaster, not seeing it, but seeing the features of the blonde girl in my mind. Did Samantha dye her hair? But what about her complexion? Perhaps the lighter hair color made her skin appear lighter? Some kind of an optical illusion? That must be it. But what about her height? She couldn't grow taller overnight. Usually she has to stretch up to kiss me. But not today. She's as tall as I am. But it was more than that. She didn't look like Samantha. Her facial features were different. Her clothes were the same ones, but she didn't wear them the same. She didn't fill them out the same way. Samantha, my Samantha, wasn't as thin as this girl was. She was broader in the shoulders and was more, well, let's just say she filled out her bra more. A random thought ran through my head that maybe I'd been in a coma or something. That this was Samantha, but more mature since last time I'd seen her. I quickly dismissed the idea. If I had been in a coma, there would have been other signs, like waking up in the hospital. Maybe I'd somehow traveled forward in time, and it wasn't really Tuesday, March 31st, 2009. I flipped open my cell phone and verified the date to be exactly what I'd expected it to be. I shook my head to clear it out. There had to be some explanation for this, but I couldn't figure it out. I picked up my coffee and laptop and went to the door to go to work. Samantha and a friend of hers were probably playing some kind of a joke on me. Like in that movie where twin girls met for the first time at summer camp and switched places to fool their parents. I smiled, thinking of Samantha going over her morning routine with some other girl, getting every detail perfect, right down to the way she kissed me on her way out the door. It occurred to me that with some strange girl in my house, it meant Samantha was probably doing the same thing in someone else's home. That worried me a little. I didn't know where she was. What if something happened to her? I wasn't the type of father who worried excessively. I like to think I worried just enough. I thought about calling her just to see if she was okay. But I decided against it. Let the girls have their fun. I was sure they were talking on their cell phones right now, laughing about the whole thing. I locked the door behind me and got into my car, chuckling about how I had thought I was going crazy. Samantha and her friend had gotten me. I was going to have to think of something clever to get back at her with. Maybe I'm scared of being alone, but baby I've got to hold my own. Cause maybe life... Work that day was pretty normal, which is to say quite hectic and I was looking forward to seeing Samantha when I got home. I found that the more I thought about her little practical joke, the more I missed not seeing her that morning. We were quite close. After Samantha's mother, Olivia, succumbed to cancer, we only had each other. Samantha had only been nine. She and Olivia were very close, and Samantha took her death pretty hard. I did too. I don't think I would have been okay if it hadn't been for Samantha. I had to be strong. I had to be both parents, but it brought us together and we pulled through. By the time I drove into the driveway, I was quite happy to be home. I was expecting to open the door and see my Samantha sitting at the kitchen table working on her homework, but that wasn't what happened. When I opened the door, it wasn't Samantha sitting there. It was a stranger, the same stranger that had been in my house this morning. She didn't hear me at first. She was listening to her iPod while she did her homework, just like Samantha would have done. When she saw me, her face brightened and she smiled at me, turning off her music. Hi, Dad, she said cheerily. Where's Samantha? I asked, perhaps a bit more abruptly than I had intended. While I did appreciate their little joke, enough was enough. I was on to them and it was time to quit playing around. What do you mean? The stranger asked. She was a good actress. She looked genuinely confused, her expressions identical to Samantha's, in spite of the differences in her facial features. I stormed over to the pictures that were hanging on the living room wall. I mean, I want my Samantha back, this Samantha, I said, raising my voice as I poked my finger at a picture of my daughter when she was in the seventh grade. She didn't say anything, 
but she took on a hurt look. I stole a glance at the picture I was still pointing to. It wasn't a picture of Samantha. It was of the stranger. They'd even gone to the trouble to trade out the pictures. That was good, but we could laugh about it later. Enough! I barked. I know you are playing a joke on me, and it was funny, but now it's over. What are you talking about? The stranger said, tears forming in her eyes. I swear, if I wasn't looking at her, I would think she was my daughter. She sounded just like her. Look, I said, softening my tone. I don't mean to upset you. It's a funny joke, but I'm starting to get a little worried about Samantha. I'm sure she's okay, but I'd really like to talk to her now. The stranger didn't say anything, but her tears began to flow freely. Before I could say anything more, she ran off and up the stairs. I heard her bedroom door slam shut behind her, just like Samantha would have done. I turned back toward the pictures on the wall. I hadn't expected them to change out the photos. But as I looked, they'd changed out more than one. They'd changed them all. This was more elaborate than I had originally given them credit for. As I looked over the rest of the pictures, my skin suddenly turned clammy and my mouth fell open. There was a picture of Olivia and Samantha, just before Olivia had passed away. It had always been Samantha's favorite. But it wasn't Samantha in the picture anymore. It was the stranger. My knees went weak and I nearly fell. I put a hand on the wall to steady myself as the room began to spin. Breathe, I thought. Just breathe. I stared down at the floor, not wanting to look at the stranger's pictures any longer. My head cleared, and I realized that they had probably photoshopped the picture, scanning in the original photo and replacing Samantha with this other girl. The picture in the frame was probably just something they did on a color printer. I pulled the frame off the wall and noticed how dusty it was. Samantha hadn't even bothered to wipe it off when she swapped out the picture. It made me smile to think about how lazy she can be sometimes. I took the back off the picture frame and pulled out the picture. It wasn't just regular paper, like I thought it would be. It was an actual picture. But when I looked at it, my knees became weak again. I dropped the frame, the glass shattering as it hit the tile floor. But I didn't notice. I staggered over to the table where the stranger had been doing her homework and sat down, my hands trembling as I stared at the picture didn't look like it had been doctored. It looked real. I turned the picture over and looked at the back. The words were written in Olivia's handwriting. Me and Samantha. April 2002. I turned it back over and stared at the picture. I looked hard. The shadows were exactly right. The lighting perfect. The girl in the picture looked younger, not the way the stranger looked now. If it was a counterfeit... It was a good one. It had to be the government doing this. It wasn't the girls playing some practical joke on me. The ruse was too sophisticated. I had to get to the bottom of this. I walked up the stairs and stood outside of Samantha's room. I was about to knock on her door when I decided to call Samantha instead. Maybe she still had her cell phone with her, wherever she was. I pressed the speed dial for Samantha and held my breath. Through the door, I could hear a cell phone ringing. It was Samantha's. The stranger even had that. I only heard it ring once through the door, but on my phone I heard it switch over to voicemail. The girl in the room had ignored my call, just like Samantha would do if she was mad at me. I closed the phone and knocked lightly on the door. There was a long silence before the girl finally answered. What? I braced myself. Just hearing her, it was my Samantha but I knew the girl on the other side of the door wasn't her. Can I come in? I asked. I heard a muffled reply that I took to be yes and eased the door open. The girl was sitting on her bed, leaning back on the pillows, her arms folded across her chest, and she was looking at the wall. Just like Samantha. I'm sorry, I said, not sure of how to start. I just want to know that Samantha is okay. She turned her head toward me, giving me a look that would curdle milk, also like Samantha would have done. Please, I added. She continued to glare at me. I am Samantha, she finally said. 
her voice little more than a whisper. It was my turn to glare. This girl, this stranger, was claiming to be my daughter. Someone whom I'd known her entire life. Who was she trying to fool? Please, I reiterated. She turned away, throwing her body to face toward the wall. Get out, she said. I didn't. Not right away. I stood there, watching her. Even looking at her back, she didn't look at all like Samantha. After more than a minute, I backed out of the room and closed the door behind me. It was obvious to me that this girl wasn't going to tell me anything. I went back downstairs and stood in the kitchen, unsure of what to do. I considered calling the police. If the stranger didn't want to tell me who she was or where my daughter was, then maybe she would tell them. They could ask for her driver's license and get to the bottom of this. That's when I realized that she had not completed her homework. All of her books were still lying open on the table, along with her iPod and her purse. No, it wasn't her purse. It was Samantha's. It was an Ed Hardy designer purse her uncle had given her for her birthday last year. There was no way that another girl would have the same purse in the same small town. My hands shook as I opened up the purse, looking inside and finding her wallet. I took out the wallet and opened it, looking through the various compartments for her license. I found it and pulled it out. I was almost afraid to look at it, but I had to. I had to know. I looked down at the photo on the license. It was the girl upstairs in my daughter's bedroom. But who was she? I moved my thumb and looked at the name on the ID. My legs buckled and I fell to the floor. The shock of seeing my daughter's name on the driver's license with a face of another girl. I couldn't think. Everything was surreal. I could hear my own breathing, louder than it should have been. Everything slowed down, moving in slow motion, even the sound of my own heart that seemed as loud as my breath. woke up on the floor. It took a few moments before I realized that I must have passed out. My hands crunched in broken glass as I tried to get up, and then I remembered dropping the picture frame and breaking the glass. I must have fallen on it when I fainted. I inspected myself and found that I had little cuts and abrasions all over my arms. I stumbled over to the kitchen sink and removed the larger pieces. The blood on my arms was mostly clotted and dried must have been out for some time. I looked at the clock on the stove and saw that it was three in the morning. Evidently, the girl had not come back down to finish her homework. Or if she had, she had left me lying there in the broken glass. I washed my arms and removed the crusted blood and tiny bits of glass. I grabbed a couple of paper towels and dried my arms before going back to pick up the driver's license. I braced myself and looked at it again, hoping that somehow it had changed, that the girls had switched back while I had been asleep. But they hadn't. It was still the stranger's face on the card with my daughter's name. I put the license back into the purse and decided that cleaning up the glass could wait until morning. I went upstairs. The hallway light was on, and out of habit I opened my daughter's bedroom door to check on her. It was something I've done every night since her mother's death. The girl in the room was fast asleep, curled up in her covers the same way Samantha always did. But even in this dim light, I could tell it wasn't Samantha. I eased the door closed again, quietly so as not to wake her. Calling the police was out of the question now. Although I considered that the license might be a fake, it certainly looked authentic. That meant one of two things. Either it was a real license and the authorities were somehow in on this little scam, or the girls purchased fake IDs and they would get in a lot of trouble for their antics. I didn't really care how much trouble the girls sleeping in my daughter's bedroom got into, but Samantha, the real Samantha, would probably get in just as much trouble. I wasn't sure I wanted to deal with that when their charade was finally over. I went into my own bedroom quickly removing my clothes and falling into my own bed. I was too worried about Samantha to get any real sleep, but I had to believe that the girls were checking in with each other, 
that Samantha was safe and sound, doing the same thing to the stranger's parents that the girl was doing to me. The next morning, I got ready for work as usual. The strange girl was subdued, though otherwise acting like Samantha, including stealing my bagel as she had the previous morning. She kissed me again, but it wasn't as warm as it had been the day before. I watched as she ran out of the house to catch her bus, running late as usual. I went to a window and looked out, verifying that the girl actually got onto the bus. I watched until the red lights went out and the bus pulled away before I took out my cell phone. I called my boss, explaining that I wasn't feeling well and that I was going to stay home. I closed the phone and went out to the car. I knew that it would take the bus about 30 minutes before it arrived at school. I planned on being there first. I wanted to know if this girl actually went to the same school as my Samantha. Then, maybe I could find out who she was. Maybe I could even catch them together and end this. I should have been angry that I was missing a day of work for all this, but I needed to find out what was going on. I needed to find Samantha. My Samantha. I sat in the school parking lot waiting for my daughter's bus to arrive. I was parked close and I hoped that the girl wouldn't notice. I had the engine off and the windows open, hoping I could catch bits of conversation among the kids. With any luck, I would hear someone call the strange girl by her real name. Her bus pulled up, and I watched as the kids got off. The girl got off too. She wasn't talking to anyone. She kept her head down as she walked, clutching her books to her chest like Samantha did. Their mannerisms were uncannily similar despite the differences in their appearance. She walked through the door and into the school, and I was no closer to discovering who the stranger was. I must have been craning to watch her, and I wasn't aware that there was anyone beside me until I heard someone clear their throat. It was a police officer. Probably the one that worked at the school. All the schools have them these days. Good morning, I said, trying to sound cheerful. Can I help you? He asked, clearly interested in what I was doing. It probably wasn't the smartest thing to do, driving to the school to spy on a 16-year-old girl. They call it stalking. Oh, I was just looking to see if that's my daughter's bus. She was already gone by the time I remembered that she had a dental appointment today. I lied. You'll have to sign her out in the administration office. The officer told me, not indicating whether he believed my story. Right, I said, quickly agreeing with him. I was just waiting until the bell rings, otherwise she won't be in class and they won't be able to find her. Okay. He replied. Have a good day. He moved away from my car, but didn't leave the area. I'm sure he was taking down my license plate number for future reference. He was probably waiting to see if I went into the school, too. I did. The windows were still down on my car, but I thought it would be safe with a police officer watching it. Once in the office, the secretary was very helpful. I told her that I needed to sign out Samantha for a doctor's appointment. She asked for my driver's license and checked it against the card she had for Samantha, ensuring that I was authorized to sign her out. Once satisfied, she had me sign a form and sent a kid to go find her. Without realizing it, the police officer had done me a favor. The kid was going to get Samantha, not the strange girl. Now, maybe I could get some answers. I sat on an uncomfortable wooden bench and waited for what seemed like an excessive amount of time before the kid came back. But he didn't have Samantha. He had the stranger with him. She just looked at me with a questioning gaze. I forgot you have a dental appointment today, I explained. We walked to the car in silence. She didn't really have an appointment, but I was hoping they would see her as a walk-in patient. An idea had formed out of my lie to the police officer. When we arrived, the girl went and sat down, listening to her iPod, while I signed her in. Does she have an appointment? The receptionist asked. No. Is she in pain? No, I just need to get a set of x-rays. She has an appointment with her orthodontist later, and I forgot that he'd ask me for new x-rays. I explained, hoping that I'd made it sound convincing. I glanced over at the girl, but she was ignoring me, listening to her music. 
Usually they just use the x-rays we have in our file. The receptionist explained. Yeah, but he asked for a new set. He told me why he needed them, but I've forgotten the reason. I lied. Would you like me to call her orthodontist? The receptionist asked. This was clearly a request she wasn't used to. No, that's okay. Can we just get the x-rays done? I don't think your insurance will pay for another set. I don't mind. I'll pay for them. This was a lot harder than I thought it would be. But the receptionist just shrugged her shoulders and asked me to have a seat. seat. It didn't take very long before we were called back, probably because we didn't need to see a doctor. I went back with a girl just to make sure they really did take a fresh set of x-rays. The assistant had her stand up to a machine that he said would take a full panoramic view of her teeth. He put a lead apron on her and I had to step out of the room while the machine was shooting radiation into the head of the girl claiming to be my daughter. Does she need individual pictures or just the panoramic? The assistant asked. I need a full set. My answer didn't seem to phase the assistant, and he went about taking the additional pictures on a different machine, putting the film in her mouth and snapping the x-rays one at a time. He soon left us alone, and the girl went back to listening to music. That was fine with me, because I didn't really know what I would have said to her. After a few minutes, she took out one earpiece. Who said they needed a full set? She asked, referring to what she'd heard me tell the assistant. You said you wanted braces, I told her. Her face brightened and she squealed. Just a little squeal. The same way she has done for as long as I can remember when she's excited. She got up and came over to me and gave me a big hug. And if I was a blind man, I would have thought it was my Samantha. But I wasn't blind, and I knew. She must have felt me stiffen when she hugged me, because she let go and backed away. The excitement leaving her face. She just went back to sit and put her earbud back in. The assistant came back with a manila envelope, handing it to me. Can I look at them? I asked. Sure. I pulled them out and held them toward the light. I couldn't tell one x-ray from another, but I pretended that I could. Are these her x-rays? I asked. Yes. They don't look the same as the last one she had. What do you mean? I don't remember this being there, I said, pointing to a white section on the picture. Mm. That's her filling, the assistant explained. Can we look at the other set in her file? I asked. There it was. I wanted to compare the x-rays of this girl to my Samantha. Finally, I would have some hard evidence, if I could convince the assistant to show them to me side by side. I couldn't tell if he thought it was strange or not, but he agreed. He took out the other set and put it up to a light board. Then he took the set I was holding and put them below the first set. I am certainly no expert on reading x-rays, but even I could see that the two sets of x-rays looked the same. The assistant pointed out some of the similarities, but I wasn't listening any longer. I wondered how they had changed my daughter's dental records. This went way beyond the idea of two girls pulling a prank on their parents. This was something much more serious. I turned back to the girl. She wasn't listening to music any longer. She was staring at me, her look a combination of worry and anger. The assistant put my x-rays back into the envelope and handed them to me. I thanked him and went to the desk where I paid for them. How did you change your dental records? I asked the girl once we were outside. You're starting to scare me, Dad, she replied. Her voice cracked and I looked over at her. She genuinely looked scared. I let the matter drop. There was no way that I was going to get her to admit to anything. I'm not getting braces, am I? When I didn't answer, she continued. Take me back to school. I'm going to be in enough trouble for not finishing my homework. After dropping off the girl at school, I went back home. I just sat there trying to make some sense out of this. Not for the first time, I thought that maybe it was me. Maybe I was going crazy. I mean, how would I know? I'm familiar in a layman kind of way with the big kinds of disorders like being bipolar and ADHD, but what if this was some other kind of mental disorder, something not so common? Maybe it was forget what the hell your daughter looks like disorder. I looked around, 
there had to be something here that couldn't be tampered with. And there, on the bottom of the bookshelf, I saw what I was looking for. Samantha's yearbooks going all the way back to kindergarten. I jumped up and grabbed one out of the middle. It was from sixth grade. I flipped through the pages, looking for a picture. And when I found it, it was not my little girl. It was this bitch. This stranger who walked into my life yesterday, hoping to replace my Samantha. The picture looked authentic. The yearbook had signatures all over it. I couldn't take it anymore. I fell to the floor and cried like a baby. I cried because I was losing my sanity. I cried because I was losing my Samantha, and I didn't know how to find her. I just cried, sitting there on the floor next to the broken glass I still hadn't cleaned up. I don't know how long I lay there, but I finally came to the realization that I was never going to get my Samantha back. I felt beaten and alone and afraid. My only option was to accept the replacement girl, whoever or whatever she was. But I couldn't do it. Not as long as I could see that she wasn't who she said she was. Good morning, Daddy. Hi, baby girl. Are you ready to get the bandages off today? Yes, I am, I said, drawing out the words. I had been lying in the hospital for more than a week now, and I couldn't wait to go home. Just then, the doctor and a nurse came in. Neither had much bedside manner, and without preamble, they began removing the bandages from my head. I could feel them cut through the gauze and pull the bandages away. I had plastic cups covering my eyes, and they pulled them off next. Once the bandages were off, the doctor started poking and prodding. Looks good, he finally pronounced. You'll be able to check out today. That sounds good, I told him. I'll send someone in to talk to you about your condition. They'll set up some classes so that you can learn to manage your daily routines. You may even be eligible to receive a service animal. You mean a seeing eye doc? Samantha asked. Yes. He turned his attention back to me. I'm also going to send in a therapist to set up counseling for you. We don't want you hurting yourself again. His words were a painful reminder of what had happened that night. Lying there on the floor with the broken glass. Unable to live with the stranger, yet unwilling to leave her behind. I picked up a large shard of glass and used it to take my eyes. The pain was excruciating, but not as bad as losing Samantha. The only way I could accept this girl as my daughter was not to see her. Then I could forget that she wasn't my daughter. Then I could accept her as my Samantha. Maybe I'm scared of being alone, but baby I've got to hold my own. Cause maybe life's not what I expected. Gotta run, run, run to the nearest exit. I think our timing's just a Author's note. My kids are a constant inspiration for my writing. This time it was a dream I had about my daughter. In the dream, she didn't look or sound like my daughter, but I knew it was her. When I woke up, I immediately started writing, and my Samantha was the outcome. I hope you enjoyed it, because I have to admit, it was a little disturbing to write. Thank you. I'm Doug McIntyre. Warning. Today's episode contains singing. Parental discretion is advised. No No more singing, please. Samantha. All right. Yeah, that's probably more than we should have gone with that. Oh, okay. Let's get this out of the way. A why a why? Why a why? Yeah, that is uh, an unusual spelling. Rish and I have always been opponents of names spelled unusually. And uh, yeah, here we go. I believe that story is actually my Samantha, but for some reason it's Samantha. Doug, what are you doing here? Come on. Oh, gosh. I, I don't know if Hayes ever told you this, 
but his name is actually pronounced Dan McIntyre. Oh, it's an unusual spelling of that, too. <laughs> I hope he forgives us for that. <laughs> Not this time. But somehow the story was good enough. We took it anyway. Must have been really good. You know, I remember being kind of freaked out when I first read this story. We talked in previous episodes about going insane or thinking that you may be losing your mind kind of thing. And I was really worried that in the end, he was going to look in the mirror and he was not going to look like himself. <laughs> or when there was bandages being removed, I thought, oh, okay, everything's going to be fine. And then her voice is not going to sound right to him either. It's like, <laughs> oh, crap, there's no winning. But he gave it a somewhat happy ending. Yeah, a slight happy spin on that. He, he's able to go on with life as long as he gouges his own eyes out. A happy ending from my life, apparently. They can bring up the lights and play the nice music while we all walk out. Good stuff. So you dug the story as well? I dug McIntyre the story, as a matter of fact. Nice one. I will see your McIntyre and raise you a mic and tree. Yeah, it's not a big twist on the world. Everything about the girl was the same, except for that she just looked different. Yeah, he was just unable to accept that. And You know, I think our, our friend, a uh, friend of the show, Abby Hilton, would call this story magical realism. Is that right? Maybe. <laughs> I have no idea. She uses this term. Basically, from my understanding, anything that could be an episode of The Twilight Zone is magical <laughs> realism. I don't know. I think this one might qualify as horror. Did this not feel exactly like something Serling would have done in The Twilight Zone? Yeah. Yeah, I think it did. Which I really like that kind of a story where something is just uh, a little off. Everything is normal except that, that, that there's that one thing. Or something is wrong and you're the only one who realizes that it's wrong. Yeah. Have we talked a great deal about The Twilight Zone on the show? I don't think so. Okay, well, I, I You've absolutely... talked a great deal about Twilight Zone off of the show, but... Well, maybe I shouldn't bend your ear. No, go ahead, because it. I'm the only one that's had my ear bent about this before. The uh, listeners haven't, so they'll be, I'm sure, on the edge of their seats trying to find out what you have to say. Okay, well, folks, prepare to get bent. Uh, 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 the Twilight Zone ran from, what, f 59 to 64, and uh, when I was a kid, I discovered the twilight zone they'd show it on uh, the little independent local channel while the other channels were showing the news okay. so right before carson started i would watch the twilight zone in the summer or on like friday nights and stuff okay and uh yeah i just never had seen any show like that i mean it's possible that there were shows similar to it before and after but it just seems to be the one that everybody remembers and, and to have made the biggest impact. I was a kid and, and I was 30 years after those episodes had aired and yet I was still completely engrossed by it. It still spoke to me in a way that a lot of the shows probably didn't, you know, it was in black and white. It should have been corny or uh, outdated. You know, of course, the cars are old and the way that people talk in some of the episodes that has dated. But the people, people are still the same. Right. And an, a messed up situation would still be messed up today. I mean, even if people are landing on Mars in 1971 or something like that, the details don't matter. The show seems to be timeless. I have a feeling that 50 years from now, maybe it will be a tiny bit more dated, but it's never going to be one of those shows where you just roll your eyes because it's so bad. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I just, I loved The Twilight Zone and it could scare the crap out of me, even though, you know, it was an old, seemingly harmless show. I, I don't know how much you and I've talked about it, but uh, sometimes the endings, especially the surprise endings or the, su the shocking, unhappy endings, they're, they're so powerful today that I wonder how they would have been back then. Uh huh. All our life, we've known the punchline to, ser to serve now. Uh -huh. Just like all our life, we've known the punchline to Soylent Green. Right. What would it have been like to not know that and just be slapped across the face? The the endings are very similar, actually. Yeah, I remember the Treehouse of Horrors thing when they get the cookbook and they're like, how to cook for humans. Yes. No, no, wait. There's more dust here. How, how to cook, cook for the humans. humans. And they're, oh, wait, wait, wait. There's more. How to cook for 40 humans. <laughs> it's like the real monsters were us. Shut up, Lisa. R.I.P. Simpsons. And now it's time for Rish's off-topic ramble of the week. 
Anyhow, I love the Twilight Zone. And uh, when I was in L.A., a friend of mine, Brian, told me, hey, do you know that they actually do uh, Twilight Zone conventions here? And oh, really? I, really? It's like, wow, well, what do they do? Well, they just, they wheel in the few people that are still alive that were in those <laughs> Twilight Zones. And they put them at desks and you can ask them questions and they take their pictures and stuff. And I was like, you're kidding. Uh, so we went to it. And uh, it was at the Beverly Garland Hotel. And Beverly Garland was an actress on the Twilight Zone. Oh. And she was there among all these other actors. Does she actually own the hotel or is right. she, it just happened to be named after her? You know, that I don't know. I know it was a Holiday Inn or something like that. But I have a feeling that she actually owned that one. And so, yeah, they just had all these tables set up in the meeting room of this hotel. And then the actors and the directors and the writers that could make it. <laughs> the ones they didn't have to wheel in on hospital beds. <laughs> Some of those episodes have been over 50 years ago. Well, that's a long, long time. Man. Yeah. And nobody's going to remember me 50 years from now. It's just, I think Rish is right. Uh, but there were all these mostly retired actors or uh, you know filmmakers that got to be in the spotlight again and, and maybe see one another because it seems like Hollywood was a small – it's a small place now, but it was a smaller place then. Everybody yeah. worked with one another and that. But Brian knew Twilight Zone a little bit better than I did and so he would say, oh, she was so-and-so and she's in that episode. And But we, I would go to the people I recognized and talk to them and then, oh gosh, people love – unless they're a-holes. People love to have somebody ask them about their work or, right. or say that, ah, I remember this kind of thing. And Are you sure I haven't told this story on the air? I don't think so. I don't know. Well, there was this woman at one of the tables, and she had been in a, an episode called Perchance to Dream. Okay. Uh, the episode is about this guy who is afraid to go to sleep because he knows th that if he falls asleep, he will die. Okay. And I guess he had gone to a carnival, and there was this cat woman. Uh huh. He had seen her on a stage, and she was, you know, doing some kind of exotic dance. You know, it's like, come in and see the exotic cat lady. 50 years from now, you'll still remember her. <laughs> he went in there and, and, you know, she's slinky, but she's got like the makeup on her eyes. So she looks somewhat cat-like or whatever. And uh -huh. and everywhere he goes, he starts to see this woman hmm. uh, following him in that. Uh, like he's on the roller coaster and he looks back and she's like two cars back and laughing. Anyway, it's really scary. He's driving home one night on the freeway or whatever they had in 1959. And he looks in the rearview mirror and she's in the back seat and he sees her eyes in the rearview mirror. And anyway, that scared me so <laughs> bad as a boy. Uh -huh. You know, as a 30-something-year-old man, I was still afraid of that. Driving <sighs> at night, looking in the rearview mirror and she is in the back seat or, or someone's in the back uh -huh. seat. Anyway, I told this to the actress who had played the Catwoman. I said, I'm sure you get this all the time. And she said, no, I, I am so sorry that, you know, I scared you like this. And I was just blown away because I expected, you know, people come up to Spielberg all the time. He's like, I still sh myself when I'm on the beach. And he's like, I know, you know, something <laughs> like that. Somebody comes up to George Lucas and says, Han shot first, you bastard. I know. Anyhow, I told her this thing and we had a laugh, I guess. And this guy comes up to me, this stranger comes up to me, and I guess he had overheard the conversation. And he said, we're, we're here filming something. Would you be willing to tell this story on film, on the air? And I said, what? what? What are you talking about? And he said, uh, we're putting out a, a definitive season-by-season -season box set of Twilight Zone, and we're going to do an infomercial for him, an hour-long infomercial. Would you be willing to appear and talk about this? And, and I said, well, of course. In the future, I'm going to be running the Dune Steve Audio Fiction magazine. I, I would love to. And, and he's like, yeah, you can bring your bald friend too. And Brian's like, really? Cool. And so we went and they'd set up one of those rooms as a little soundstage where they just put up curtains and closed it off and set up two cameras and lights and chair. And I guess they were just having testimonials of people talking about their favorite Twilight Zone episodes. Huh. So we sat in there and waited our turn and there was a guy in front of us and he's like, and then Bridget is married us glasses break and he can't see and it's so not fair and, and the whole world has come to an end and he's blind you and they're like next and the next person comes in and they ask him who they are and he's like what's your favorite episode and it's like yeah so there's a guy and he's on an airplane and he looks out the window and the chewbacca's on the wing of the plane and he's and got captain kirk is freaking out there's something on the wing of the plane can't you see it's there spock so, so they just sat down with people for, I don't know, two minutes, two and a half minutes, maybe three minutes, maybe even less. 
Uh-huh. Maybe it's like a minute and a half. Just long enough to tell your name and your favorite episode kind of thing. Uh-huh. So they sat Brian down and put a mic on him and asked him his name. And, and he described his favorite episode. I think it might have been a stop at Willoughby. I, I don't know. Uh, and two minutes passed and they said, okay, thank you. And then they sat me in the seat and they asked me my name. And they, oh, Well, you know, I think the guy just said, tell about that story about when you were scared. And so I told that. And they said, okay, well, why do you think that Twilight Zone has survived as long as it has? And he's like, what do you like about the Twilight Zone? And I'm starting to realize that I've been sitting on this chair for a long time. And they said, okay, well, what's your favorite episode? I, I like so many of them, but, I, you know, I think my favorite episode is Walking Distance. And they, like, looked at each other. I guess nobody's favorite episode is Walking Distance. <laughs> and they're like, okay, describe that episode. That Walking Distance is about this man, and he's, he's a businessman, and he's got all this pressure, and his life has not worked out the way that he wanted it to and he goes for a drive and he ends up going back to his hometown uh-huh. and when he gets there it's when he was a child and he encounters himself as a little boy and he tries to tell himself not to make the mistakes that he has made to impart the wisdom that he's had to himself as a child and the kid of course doesn't listen the kid is afraid uh-huh. And he ends up running into his father, who's long since died. And he's able to talk to his dad. And uh, <laughs> it's weird, as I was describing this story uh, and why it was important to me or why it stuck with me, I, I, I guess I had started to cry at some point, And I was just like, oh, gosh, I'm sorry. And the guys are like, no, 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 keep, keep going, keep going. They were digging it or they were <laughs> glad what they were getting. So I'm saying, like, you know, it just it, it, it's so relevant to me you know it's like my I, I wish that i could go back and tell myself to do things differently or change things or you know just the opportunity to go back at what would you do and and that's kind of what twilight zone was all about is what would you do every single week you know whether it's a good thing or a bad thing that happens and right i think that's one of the reasons why it's endured so much is everybody asks themselves, you know, what would I do in this situation? And that's, that's always going to be powerful. The, the best storytelling, whether it's from Shakespeare's day, is always going to reach people and touch people, even if they can't even connect to the time period in which it was written. And the guys are like, okay, hey, thank you very much. And Brian came up to me and he's like, dude, they were talking to you for almost an hour. <laughs> and I was like, really? Wow, that's, that's weird. And the guy, the director came up to me. He's like, oh, thank you, man. So glad that you volunteered to do this. Thank you. Live long and prosper. No, whatever the Twilight Zone people say. And uh, <laughs> anyway, I guess they started showing this darn infomercial like late at night. And, oh, geez, I was all over this stupid uh-huh. thing. And, uh, <laughs> of course, you know, they, they, they get two seconds from everybody else. But then me crying about the friggin' Twilight Zone. Sweet. And we... And yeah, I, I, Brian said that I should have called that guy and said, I want the whole box set for free or something like that because you used me to sell your product and all that. And I was just flattered, I guess, that I got to be on there, but also embarrassed in the same way that any time that I make a fool of myself. Once a week here on the show. There you go. Zing! It's, it's, it's funny. I, I'm easily moved or easily fired up or easily manipulated. And if we could somehow channel that okay so anyhow there's my story that's why i uh i love the twilight zone and that, that's why i responded so well to my simantha because yeah uh, what would you do in that person's place i don't know what i would do if that same thing happened to me it kind of freaks me out just to imagine it when you see it whether it's in a movie because because lots of times they will make movies that could easily have been Twilight Zone episodes or or short stories or whatever it is, you'll ask yourself, what what I would do? And sometimes characters are stupid. Uh-huh. Characters do things that the writer has manipulated them to do. And you'll be like, whoa, 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 whoa. Why not just pick up the paper and turn to any random page? And that way you'll know. Um, and people don't do it. But I, I feel like the main character, the I character in my Samantha, was pretty smart. And yeah. He, he checked his bases. He checked the yearbooks, the driver's license. The dental records. Right. You got to ask yourself, well, how long would I continue to delude myself that it's a prank? Or you uh-huh. know, how long would I insist that I was right and everybody else was wrong? It could have gone farther. He could have questioned his daughter's friends. 
he could have tied her up and stuck her with sodium pentothal and asked her all these questions. He could have done the old show me the scratch on your knee. How did you get that kind of thing? Right. But of course, the fact that she was 16, uh, she didn't seem too yeah, she... willing to, to go along or answer his questions. Um, she was a little reticent on the whole uh, you're not Samantha front. But, you know, maybe you would have sat her down and just explained the situation. He never really did that. And I don't know if it was because he was so sure that it was a prank or because of the way that she was acting. But that's the fun of these kind of stories is how would I handle it? And I I love it when characters just cover all the bases and they're really smart and they do things that are like, oh, yeah, I wouldn't even have thought to do that. I don't really know what the deal was, but I never really saw The Twilight Zone when I was a kid, so I never developed the same uh, affection for it that you have, but I still... You you never watched The Twilight Zone in high school? (laughs) But I really enjoy those kinds of stories, though, the ones that have that something is wrong here kind of a feel, something is off, like today's story, or like a lot of the stuff that you've written in the past. Uh, Yeah, I I, I have a soft spot for these kind of stories, so... uh submissions you want to send a story that could be a twilight zone episode chances that's right. are i'm gonna like it that's right they're open again if you'd like to send us a story just send it on down to submissions at dunesteef.com something that we talk about all the time i always try and imagine what a 1950s or early 60s audience would how they would respond to these stories that are so shocking today or you know sometimes i have a an idea that the people of the 50s were simpler, or they were much more naive, or, you know. Uh-huh. And, I've always had that impression for some reason, but you get that kind of a, a dichotomy in, in media that goes back, you know, in movies and TV and stuff like that. They'll, they'll show the 50s, and sometimes they'll portray it as completely innocent and happy place, and then other times they'll portray it as this, like, seedy, awful, terrible time or something, and Somehow those both go together in the mind of the public. You just have to figure out which version you're in when you get into your story. Yeah, I I guess in the media, there was a lot of censorship. A lot of the things that we consider old-fashioned, the the way people talked on television, that's not the way people actually talked. It was the way that they were allowed to talk on television kind of thing. Uh, There's this episode called The Hitchhiker that everybody remembers where there's this woman driving uh, across country by herself and uh, she keeps passing this stranger, this man that says, going my way. Mm -hmm. No matter where she goes, he's always up ahead waiting with his thumb out to be picked up and she just tries to make sense of it. And finally she's, uh, I think she's got a flat or she runs out of gas and she stops somewhere and there's a there's a sailor and he helps her out, get her car back on the road. And she says, where are you heading to? And he says, oh, I'm going to San Diego or San Francisco or San Bernardino. Okay. San Tropez. Samantha. <laughs> He's going to the West Coast. And uh, she says, get in. I'll drive you all the way and kind of thing. And he's like, wow, thank you. I, first, he's like coming on to her and asking her about herself. But he starts to realize that there's something very wrong with this woman. And, you know, she's just overly appreciative that he's with her. And it's just that because she's so scared. And at one point, she sees the hitchhiker up ahead. She swerves the car. And the car keeps going. And he's like, lady, lady, jeez, you almost went off the road. And she goes, did I hit him? And he's like, what? Hit who? And he's like, that hitchhiker. And she's like, I thought that if I hit him and killed him, then maybe he would leave me alone. And he's like, you were trying to hit that guy? Oh, uh, hey, lady, uh, you need to just let me off right here kind of thing. And she just starts freaking out. And he's like, no, 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 I'll, I'll take you all the way to where you need to go. And he's like, no, hey, lady, I'm sorry. You know, you're nice and all. I appreciate the ride. but uh, <laughs> And it goes where I didn't think it was going to go. And she says, I like you. That's why I stopped and gave you a ride. I thought you were cute. If you'll stay in the car with me. And I was like, holy crap, this is not dated in any way. She just offers to sleep with this guy if he will stay in the car. And of course, she doesn't come out and say it. But I knew what was going on. And I was like, oh, this is something. If you were looking for it, you're like, why? Oh, I see what she's saying. And that impressed me. And yeah, he's having none of it. He knows that this girl is just unstable. He practically jumps out of the car. Uh, And I just thought, you know, if I were remaking this episode today, you wouldn't really change much. Yeah. Just make it more explicit what she says she'll do. That's really good. Just change the lines where she says, I'll lick your if you stay in the car. Wow. Oh, well, I guess that's it for our show.
One more thing we ought to remind them about the Broken Mirror episode. Still ongoing. That's right. You have until June 7th, we decided. That's a Monday. To get us your Broken Mirror story based on... The premise is... A child is proclaimed king... Or queen. But it turns out to be more than just a game. (laughs) Extra points if you write it in that same voice. (laughs) Just send us that story to submissions at doonstief.com and put in the subject line, Broken Mirror Story. So we know that you're entering that and not just a regular submission. So we can put it in the right folder. Whoever comes up with the highest scores will get their stories made into episodes. It should be a lot of fun. And if it's not, you're doing something wrong. Terrible. That's right. That brings us to the end of the show. Uh, Uh, But we were going to talk about Iron Man for a sec. Okay. Iron Man 2 came out. Good night, folks. Warning, the movie spoilers. It's been a while now, hasn't it? It has. uh, We haven't even gotten together since that movie came out, have we? Yeah, this is the first time. Interesting. We we actually went out and and saw this one together. Uh, What did you think of that film? Did you have anything to say to the folks at home? Uh, You know, I don't know what it says about the film that I liked the last 30 seconds after the credits (laughs) better than anything in the film. We could actually talk about that for a minute. The Iron Man movies seem to be set in a fairly realistic universe, Uh a realistic world. As far as I know, there's no magic. There's no alien rings that the Mandarin wields or anything like that. All of Iron Man's abilities and that are are from technology. It's somewhat feasible, although I felt that suitcase armor was kind of... A little much? I don't know. That's just me. Um, Not nearly as bad, and by bad I mean the opposite of good, as Brian Singer's X-Men movies being set in reality. Uh But then suddenly, after the movie, you get a hint that there's more than just technology and reality in this universe. I mean, right? The hammer of a god (laughs) being found in the New Mexican desert. Doesn't that just open up the Iron Man universe to amazing new possibilities? I think it does. That's one thing that I think is really cool that they've started into with... uh, I guess the first one that they started that with was Iron Man when they had Nick Fury uh, appear at the end of that one. And all of a sudden you're like, this guy wasn't part of this before. They're opening up this universe. And that same summer, then you have Tony Stark appearing in the Hulk movie. And you're like, this is similar to what they do in the actual comic books where the various characters will appear in the other books. Iron Man will fight Hulk or whatever from the other stories and all of a sudden we're we're starting to have this opened up is there another series of films out there that's ever done anything like this where you have separate series but they come together i can think of two examples at the end of predator 2 uh-huh you go into this predator spaceship and there was the head the skull of an alien from the, the geiger or the ridley scott alien films And then they ended up doing crossover Aliens versus Predator movies. Oh, that's right. And then at the end of, gosh, it was the worst of of the Friday the 13th movies. Jason Goes to Hell. Freddy Krueger's claw comes out and it grabs Jason's helmet, his mask. And then we had this Freddy Freddy versus versus Jason Jason crossover movie. You know, I I guess they did King Kong versus Godzilla 15 years (laughs) ago. That's true. It doesn't happen very often. This isn't a film reference, but there was the Happy Days, Laverne and Shirley, Mork and Mindy universe where you would get, you know, Laverne and Shirley would be on Happy Days or Mork from Orc would appear on Happy Days. And that was an interesting little bit. I guess all three of those shows were going at the same time and they would do little crossover appearances like that, too. It's funny. There was a crossover episode of Boston Public and The Practice, uh, which were on two different networks, ABC and Fox. And I happened to be working on Boston Public that day. And they said, if any of you guys want to stick around for a couple hours after we're doing this crossover with The Practice, and you can just be in The Practice and you'll get paid for two shows for one day. And so I got to do that. And I thought that was really neat that they did that crossover thing. And I know that David E. Kelly did that on other of his shows but uh, that's cool. Uh, Buffy did that with Angel. No, oh, for well, a while constantly. until they went to another network, and then that didn't work out as well. Well, Six Million Dollar Man and the Bionic <laughs> One. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry, I'm beating it into the ground. I only mm-hmm. wanted to talk for a minute about Iron Man, but just suddenly the world opens up. Yeah, and I think that one of the reasons that John Favreau didn't want to do the Avengers movie 
was because he didn't want to have to deal with all this aliens the, and gods and yeah, which is interesting. But because I come from the comic books first and the movies came later, I have no problem at all with the X Men going into space and fighting aliens and, uh-huh. and things like that, or there being characters that have magical powers. There's at least one X Man with magic as their mutant ability. You know, I had no problem with that. And I know that Singer always wanted it to be more realistic or, uh-huh. you know, he even fought against having Magneto and Storm fly. But, you know, that's to each their own. Those movies made a buttload of money. Uh, that may be part of the reason why uh, Favreau wanted to do that is because uh, X Men was that way and it made a lot of money. And Batman Begins was the same way. I don't, and that was again another one where it's super realistic. So maybe. He just thought he had a better chance of success. And Iron Man is a really technological type character. So uh, there's that. But I think that is super cool that they're opening up that universe and having crossovers. And hopefully that keeps on going and we'll be able to see all sorts of things where they're going back and forth like that. Because I guess because of the cost of movies and owning the properties back and forth with the various studios owning certain things, you know, it's just something that's not easy to do in a film, you know. So maybe that's part of the reason why you don't see it so much. I'm excited to see what we get. There's the rumor out there that Joss Whedon may be the guy directing our uh, Avengers film when it comes out in 2012. So we'll have to see if that actually pans out. He's in negotiations to direct that movie. And it, Wonder Woman, he was actually hired on. I mean, he was writing. He was being paid for that movie. And that movie's in the trash can now. So take that with a grain of salt. We'll have to see if that actually materializes. But if it does, I'll be one of the first guys in line to see it, I think. Yeah, you can do no better in my mind than to hire Joss Whedon to do your comic book movie because he gets comic books. He's also a really talented filmmaker and uh, he has a passion. I I saw an interview with Avi Arad where he said that they asked Joss to work on the Captain America script for that forthcoming film just because Joss had a perspective that the actual writers, the screenwriters didn't have of having idolized Captain America his whole life. And uh, to me, that's one of those things that that can really help a film. Yeah, someone that actually loves the subject matter instead of just is going to is like, well, I guess I'm going to update it and make it realistic and take it out of that world. But I'll do it. It's much better to get somebody that actually cares about it. It can work either way. But like on all the, the documentaries that you've ever seen about the Lord of the Rings films, they just go on and on about how much they revered these books. Right. Christopher Lee knew the books back and forth and read them every single year for the past 60 years. <laughs> and, and just astounding love and respect for the source material. I don't know. I guess that can backfire if you're too reverent to the source right. material. But it, it's rare. I always err on the side of respect for the right, source material. Right. Huh? There was just one other thing that I wanted to say about Iron Man. And it may be too late now that the time has gone. But... I really missed the uh, the Macarena song from the first one. Do you remember the the first mm-hmm. Iron Man movie? The theme was dan 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 I guess that's good that I don't. Yeah, I just remember the Black Sabbath song. I was really glad to see all the same actors back again. Um, I really like when Paltrow is Pepper. And you can't not like Tony Stark being played by Robert Downey Jr. He's just really, really good. He brings a lot to that character. And it's really fun to see him spitting out the lines that he's got. He does just a great job. So it, it's enjoyable. If you liked the first one, you're going to like the second one. It may not be earth-shattering or, or whatever. It's not going to bowl you over like a dark knight did but uh it was a good time and i like don Cheadle better than the other guy which makes it uh an improvement although i don't know if uh everybody else agrees with me you know i haven't really talked to that many people i know a lot of people think that uh the villain sort of got the short shrift in iron man 2 but isn't it rare that we'll have a sequel in a superhero film where the focus is on the superhero (laughs) (laughs) yeah i liked the fact that you had your smarmy villain of uh Justin Hammer, as well as your crazy, insane robot-making 
whiplash guy out there as well. Sometimes you can complain, and we've complained a lot on this show about shows that overdo the villain by getting many and trying to get them all into one. But this was a, a good way of including a second villain. You the, have the mastermind, and then you right. have the, the, the henchman. The right, thing. and that, that worked muscle. out well. It was good stuff. I guess we probably could have done a whole episode on it if we had recorded right after we saw the movie, but it's been too long. We'll we'll do something, some movie. This maybe Toy Story three we'll talk about, or okay, there's something yeah, else we'll coming have out to see that. Yeah, I was that we're all excited about. There's not any other superhero movies this summer, is there? We don't get a DC or a. Technically, Jonah Hex is DC's offering this summer, but I'd say one out of ten people that go see it will realize that it's a dc comics yeah i not ever heard of it it's got megan fox in it we'll go oh okay yeah you know it's funny i also wanted us to sit down and watch the 1981 clash of the titans and then go see the remake when it came out and do an episode about that but then when the movie was actually coming out it it looked so awful to me (laughs) that i said no i won't go see it so we missed out on a potentially interesting conversation there uh, I guess you and I could go see it when it gets to the cheap theater. Yeah, we could uh, about it. discuss the values of remakes or lack of values of remakes. But uh, yeah, we'll just let people go their way. And uh, if you uh, haven't seen Iron Man 2 yet, stay through the whole movie, please. Yeah, I was surprised when a lot of people in the theater got up and walked down. I was just like, wow, have n- none of these people seen the first one? Oh, are we still talking? I'm no, sorry. Good we night. we have to be. See ya. Thank you, Doug, for sending that story in. I appreciate you kind of freaking me out there. (laughs) Yeah, thanks a lot for the story, Doug. It was good stuff. I hope you uh, all enjoyed the show, if that was possible. There's a signpost up ahead. Our next stop, (laughs) the end of the show. All right. So I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm not. We don't have a quote for this week, folks. Yeah. Or ever again. Is that true? I don't know. We'll see. Oh, well, good night. All right. See ya. Do you have something to say about today's episode? Drop by our website at doonstief.com and leave a comment. Thanks for listening. The Doonstief is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license, meaning share it with everyone, but don't sell it or change it. Take two. Ooh, that's what I call big. Anklevich. Ah, uh, can't ask for a better setup for that's what she said. Sadly, that has not been my experience. Could I have another story by Doug McIntyre? Well, it just so happens that here one is. How about that? Well, I do hope it's not got a terrible title. What, what is it called, sir? Well, it's called My Simantha. <coughs> Dear Lord, no! Yes, that's right. Samantha with a Y. Why would you do this? My, 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 my. Woo! The first of many performances of one of the most overrated songs of the 1980s. All right, you want to narrate? Actually, you don't get to narrate. I get to, so there. Suck it! Wait, wait, then who is the... There's no... I'm Samantha? (laughs) Perhaps. Did you just fart? Stop that. It's a chair. It's disgusting. It's a chair he's farting. You're ruining my takes. Without visual validation, it sounded exactly like Samantha. I mean, Samantha. Who spells it with a Y? (laughs) Let's get that out of the way right now. Like in that movie where twin girls met for the first time at summer camp. And did it one with another in slow motion for extended... Oh. No, uh, switch places to fool their parents is actually what it says. That's that's right. Yeah, there is no... (laughs) That was the other... No such other movie is the one I was describing. That was the other movie that you saw that was that way. I heard a muffled reply that I took to be yes. (laughs) Muffled reply. I'm answering it to that.
Ah, uh, yes, yes, come in, whatever, dudes, I hear you knocking, but you can't come in. My knees went weak. I nearly fell. Stop farting. You need to say and. And not, it's a chair. <laughs> Looking through the various compartments for her license, I found it and pulled it out. And there was a bloody hook. Then I could accept her as my Samantha. The and. Is that the end? <laughs> Sitting in a movie show, thinking nasty thoughts. Warning, today's episode contains singing. Ooh, my little pretty one, my pretty one. Okay. My, 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 my Samantha. Are we going science fiction or sci-fi? Which she prefer? Yeah. Go science fiction. Some people don't like sci-fi and get upset about it. They can lick the taint of Satanas. Oh. He's able to go on with life as long as he gouges his own eyes out. It's a Greek tragedy type happy ending. This is Oedipus. It's like his children were raped, but they weren't murdered, see? So it's all sci. <laughs> Mantha. Can't tell whose mic is making problems now. I just mocked the story. Okay, I think you're fine. Well, thank you. You're quite handsome yourself. <laughs> oh, yeah. My little pretty one. My pretty one. Get my rocks off, please, Sharona. Even though you're only 10 and I'm 41. <laughs> oh, God. Well, uh, I, you've read the lyrics to this song. <laughs> yeah, they were pretty bad. A Mr. Bigglesby Anklevich, age 35. Not as fat as he used to be, but soon he will discover that the fatter you are, the longer you can survive in the Twilight Zone. Okay, well, I, I You've absolutely... You've talked a great deal about Twilight Zone off of the show, but... Uh, you know, we did reference Twilight Zone in a couple episodes ago. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you know what? Nobody laughed. Isn't that the way it is every time you make a joke, though? Okay, I, I was hoping if you didn't point it out to the audience, they might not catch on. Thank you. I didn't watch The Twilight Zone. I watched Love American Style instead, unfortunately, so, you know. I... Are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> that was like 1972. I am kidding you, yeah. Oh. I did see one episode of Love American Style once. Was it the Happy Days intro episode? No. Yeah, under what circumstances? It was on, like, daytime TV. I, I think I was actually at a friend's house, like, over the summer, you know, when you get stuck watching all sorts of weird stuff. Why find yourself watching Ultraman or all those shows that, you know, you only can see at noon on a Thursday or something. But, yeah, so that's why I became a romance fan, because I watched Love American Style. Only You're a read, romance fan? Yeah, I only read romances. Harlequins, those are my favorites. Anything that has Fabio on the cover, I love. Well, I think you're speaking for all of us there. <laughs>